Hi, everyone. Um, how's it going? Uh, so just a little bit of background. Uh, last week, I was at the Open Data Science West um, conference where I um, attended the boot camp. And the first day of the boot camp, there was a training called uh, Introduction to Machine Learning with R. Um, and so I entered this, I entered this training without realizing the level of knowledge that was assumed in the training. Um, I basically lost, I basically lost, uh, it, it was taught by uh, Jared Lander, who is like, you know, I guess prolific in the data science community. And um, I basically like, you know, I kind of was following him for like the first three hours, but then from hours three to eight, um, I just sort of lost him. So uh, I asked him towards the end of the conference if there are any resources that he would recommend for me to go through. Um, and he recommended, among others, he recommended a book to me, um, that, which I linked in the chat and which I can send um, again called uh, Tidy Modeling with R. It was written by the same person, group of people rather, but you know Max Kuhn, I think, was ahead of it, who developed this meta package, which is tidy models. And Max Kuhn was also the guy who had developed an earlier machine learning package for R called Carrot, which he then um, what he was then employed. He got a job at R Studio and then developed an updated version of um, uh, like a good machine learning inter interface with R. Um, but if you go on the Tidy Models website, they have a lot of different resources and you really don't need to have that much prerequis prerequisite knowledge outside of like basic statistics to pick things up and get going, not just with the other resources they have available, but also with the Tiny Modeling with R um, book. So a bit of a disclaimer, I have not finished the book. Um, like I said, when I sat through the training, I didn't understand most of what he was talking about. Um, and I'm not completely done with the book yet, but um, I, I have finished enough to um, kind of like talk a little bit about it and like give a brief overview of the steps that go into it. And, um, you know, maybe hopefully inspire some interest in you guys. Maybe this is something you were considering, but you didn't know where to start. Maybe um you just wanted to get into it for your own personal reasons um but i found that this was a very versatile and streamlined approach um they may they really make it easy for you so anyway without any further ado let me get let me get started so this is incredibly basic i know you guys know what a model is but just to get things going models are mathematical tools that are used to describe um, systems or or data or relationships of variables within data um, and they can be used for a variety of different things surely you guys know that for example models are used to recommend products to you on amazon or um they're oh that's fine hi abby how's it going i'm just you're 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 not late at all so um i was just getting into what a model is which uh, you know, it, it, it's like the stuff, the thing on LinkedIn that tells you to connect with your old, you know, high school classmate that you haven't talked to in eight years. It's, it's, um, it can be expressed as an equation, you know, um, which is an area that I don't have much knowledge in, but you, you can, if you want to uh, represent a model as an equation. Um, and that's historically how they have been represented. Um, and on the right, we have a couple of examples, and these examples kind of highlight broadly the two types of models there are, which are, um, or rather the two types of problems that models can address, which are classification problems and regression problems. Um, and at the top, you have a classification problem. Classification problems kind of, it, it's, it's like um, a model that like attempts to, the model attempts to uh, sort sort input into different categories. Um, here we have good quality and bad quality, but you know, you could have of you know conceivably many different 
categories for a model to sort data into. And that's more qualitative. Whereas quantitative at the bottom, you have uh, deals with numbers and deals with predicting uh, uh, numerical values. Um, so anyway, this is all stuff might be review for me. It was a little bit review for me as well, but like I said, um, I'm also learning. So this is the uh, workflow that was used in the tiny tiny models uh, book that kind of illustrates the uh, flow chart or the overview of how modeling works in data analysis. And some of these words might already be um, steps might already be. Uh, familiar to you, like, for example, exploratory data analysis, we do that, we're data scientists. Uh, but then other other steps like feature engineering, model evaluation, um, that that was more novel to me, but but basically, you, with tiny models, or tidy models, you have um, um, like a holistic set of packages with a unified interface, which I'll get to later that allow you to do all of these steps in a way that doesn't require you to be an expert on any of these steps. And um, over here, you see that these are like the initial models you attempt to use um, on your uh, training data. And you'll notice they have blue and yellow bands. And these blue and yellow bands represent uh, validation, like testing, testing the model and, and validating against like a small subset of your training data and then further fine tuning or, or altering the model to not not to overfit, not to get too close, not to get a model that only works on your training data, but to um, create a model that is general, generalizable enough to apply to other data sets while still also accurately describing the one that you're training it on. Um, so I said unified user interface, what I mean by that, um, as it's, Prior to tidy models or prior to whatever carrot even, um, it used to be that uh, uh, all of these models, for example, I mean, it still is the case, these packages still exist, but um, basically the, these, these functions, they all have a predict, the, these packages all have a predict, um, have a predict function, right? But the way these predict functions work are all different syntactically as far as the parameters that they have, the sort of arguments they accept. Um, they're all different from each other. As you can see, there's there's predict, um, you know, whatever. I don't. I'm not even really that familiar with these functions, but you can see that they're all different from each other, and that presents a problem because then you're forced to memorize what like all the different types of predict functions and what type of arguments they accept, and you have to constantly, you know, consult documentation, and um, that is inefficient that that presents that's a problem you know that's that's maybe it's good for the developers who are making this function but not necessarily good for you um so uh what 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 tidy models does is um it, it, it attempts to create an interface for people using this package that allows you to access all these, all the different cons constitutive, all the different, you know, comprising packages um, in a way that doesn't require you to know everything about the functions within each package, right? Um, and it applies tidyverse principles. You guys are probably familiar with um, tidyverse, right? It, it's it's basically like seeking to take all of these packages that are, you know perfect for modeling in R and, and putting them under the same umbrella and giving you a way to interact with them that isn't messy or confusing. Um, so some of the examples they give in the book is uh, one, one design principle they use is they don't contrive default arguments for functions. They, whenever possible, they'll ask you, hey, like, can you give me the file name for read CSV? Um, that's not within this, that's not a function in the package, but you know what I mean? It's it's you know write pat write functions that don't that don't um, when they can they don't assume what the argument is they um, they prompt you for the argument. Uh, but at the same time, you want to derive default arguments from the data whenever possible. Like you know, and I can't easily think of any good solid examples for this, but um, you know 
broad in an abstract way you could say do not you know if if you have uh if you're writing a function where one of the parameters requires um the user to tell you or tell the function like uh, what kind of data type is within is in the uh, input uh, you should instead try to infer the data type from the actual data itself you know um, and then decide what type of data it is internally uh, in general, take data structures that users have, not ones that the developers want. For example, you know, don't write functions that only accept data matrices. You know, be able to coerce whatever object they give you into the kind of object that you need for the function. Um, okay, so here, from here on out, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of all the different steps that they talked about. Um, for this presentation, I will be giving you um what they mostly talked about in the book and not what jared lander gave as his um pipeline because that was very complicated and um it was difficult for me to really understand he had his own way of doing things um but you know in a few weeks i think by the time our stats club rolls around i will be able to give like a more comprehensive tutorial on this um so for exploratory data analysis you want to ask yourself um what are my predictors and what are my outcomes? Um, you know, you want to be able to have an understanding of what your data is. You guys are familiar with this. Are there any redundant features? Um, are there any obvious errors or missing data within the within the data set? Um, and what are the associations between the predictors and the outcomes? Which predictors are seen most correlated with the outcomes? Um, and by the way, for in case you guys don't know, when I say outcome, that's kind of like the dependent variable and then predictor is like the independent variable or like outcome is, is more like the result and predictor is more like an input to think of it that way. Um, and so this is an example of what you would do in the course of exploratory data analysis here um shoot i should probably give you a link well whatever this will be i'll definitely have this by the time our stats club rolls around but in the book they use like a data set for this town in iowa called ames and they have like the housing prices for all of the uh for the town and uh the outcome variable is the sale price and so what the book recommends is you want to first bin you want to first like plot your sale price to even look at where like the media what the median sale price is for example um, and what they really recommend you do is if you're dealing with numerical data um, is to log transform your uh it's to log transform your um outcome variable and that is because if you log transform your outcome variable it uh it, it prevents the prediction, the possible prediction of negative values. Um, but it also, and I don't understand this quite as well, but it also stabilizes variance um, so that any sort of inferences made in the future could be considered more legitimate. Is everyone following me so far? Am I, am I making sense? Is everyone good? Can you give me a thumbs up or? Yeah, it's going well. Okay. Um, okay, cool. All right. Any questions so far, by the way? No, okay, cool. All right, let's keep going then. So they, they uh, in the book, they have a very like, um, I don't know, like monetary way. You wanna think of your data as money, I guess. And so they, they have a chapter called spending our data. Um, you guys, this is again, very basic stuff in machine learning. If you guys even forayed into it, maybe thought like, I'll take the first two classes of a Coursera course and then give up like I have done, you might already know about this, but you want to split it into the testing set and your training set. Your training set is what you'll be doing, what you'll be working on for most of your modeling process testing set is um, testing set is what you're holding out until the end to test the efficacy of your model uh, against uh, previously un, 
unseen data, data that your model has not uh, interacted with. Um, so here, uh, right, so here they're, they're splitting it across uh, the sale price um, and then they're extracting it using the training and testing functions. Um, and it does this automatically for you. Uh, so that step is pretty easy. There are a lot of things that go into it, but like every other step in the remainder of this presentation, I'm just giving a brief overview. Uh, next you have feature engineering. So what you want to do is to see how for, for your desired model, for your desired um, for what you want to do with your data set and how you want to train your model, you want to um, make sure that the values of your predictors sort of are, are uh, good, are good for it, you know, are, are compatible with it. You want to, for example, impute missing values. Maybe you have certain predictors that aren't necessary, or um, maybe, for example, you have a predictor with uh, categorical data, and say they're only like, say they're like two or three like common categories, and then there's like one or two categories that only appear a handful of times in your data set. You know, there are ways to sort of lump them together and, and, and streamline your data in a way that's it, that that would be the most usable for your your future model um and so this package recipes which is part of uh tidy models it allows you to create uh, um and by the way there's like a lot of like food they make a lot of food references in this um in this package but um it allows you to create a model by using the piping symbol like the per, the the percent greater than percent pipe, right? So um, here's a very simple example. Uh, you have the formula. Uh, you want to you you want to organize the you want to make a recipe um, around the sale price with the different um, predictors, uh, and the data set is aim strain, right? So you want to log transform. Uh, the greater living area, and you want to create dummy variables out of all of the nominal predictors. So dummy variables, um, because models, most models cannot, uh, most if not all models cannot handle categorical data. They like they can't handle like text. What they do, what they do when you create dummy variables is you create um, columns which have a binary value for whether or not this categorical, this categorical data applies to this particular row. Does that make sense? So like, um, I don't know, I don't know how I can best describe this to you verbally, but th does that, does that make sense? Does anyone need a better explanation of what dummy variables are? It's like, it's like, let's say you have like a uh, red, green, blue, Right. Instead, they take red, green, blue, and they make them into separate columns. And then, whether or not that row is red or green or blue uh, depends on whether or not that column has a one in it or a zero. Right. So that's that's basically what dummy variables are. And you know, you want to do that to your nominal data. That's an example of how you prepare, or that's how, that's an example of something that goes into preparing your recipe, feature engineer. So, that, um, so that's something some that. Other, sorry. The dummy variables and stuff like that. That's something that normally is done using the model.matrix function that we looked at when we when we um, check the explorer model matrix package from Bioconductor. Um, mm -hmm. So that function makes all those dummy variables, and um, um, and it works well for like a lot of the things we do in genomics. But like um, there's a lot more complicated models and stuff that these packages from tidy models support. And um, in some of them you have to, um, you have to do other things, right? So I guess here they're, they're saying like, you have to be very explicit about what you want your mm -hmm. model to look like using the, these mm -hmm. recipes. 
Yeah, so uh, you can, I mean, like we saw in the previous slide, you can save your recipe into an object and then every single step you use, um, if you use the translate function, I'm um, sorry, not the translate function, but uh, there, there is a function you can use that will basically explicitly tell you what each step was. Um, but it, it, it can also tell you like the operate, like here it says the operations. So I guess you don't even need to use a separate function, but it tells you what the operations are. It kind of like ensures reproducibility if you include um, all of your transformations in a recipe. And something they say actually in the book is you do not want to, you, you do not want to do any transformation on features outside of the recipe and you do not want to do any transformation on the outcome inside of uh, a recipe if that makes sense because because um certain problems can arise if you want to apply the same recipe to a future data set um let's say if you try to like log transform your data within a recipe log transform your outcome variable within a recipe then if you were to use a future data set or someone else were to use your uh, use your model in a future data set um, and maybe the outcome variable is already log transformed you would run into some sort of error so um, it's re mostly recommended that you use uh, uh, these steps on on your inputs um, let me know by the way if i'm going too far over because i have a bad sense of time when it comes to planning uh presentations but here's some other examples of um here's some other examples of steps you could do um for example the top one step other kind of like others um uh others all of your nominal um uh, nominal features uh if their frequency is below a default of like five percent or something like that 0 0.05 uh then and these NZV, I don't remember what it does, but I put it there thinking I would remember. Uh, mode impute, as the name suggests, it helps you impute um, nominal data uh, and then KNN impute um, sort of like can impute the numeric data based on like the values of its nearest K nearest neighbors. So there are other things you can do. There's a variety of different steps you can take, um, but this is all part of like, building the mod building preparing the data and building um engineering the features to be most compatible with the model you end up using so this is an example of what uh uh jared did on the data that we use it's a different data set um but uh like as you can tell with these notes like i don't really know what's going on what he's talking about um but uh for example step nzv here it says yeah remove columns with very little variability near zero near zero variance that's what it stands for nzv um so you can have like a long recipe is what i'm trying to say um and so this is the workflow for a recipe you want to you want to define the pre-processing and then you want to prep it by calculating statistics from the training set and then you want to apply pre-processing to data sets uh, i might get to this later but there is like a different way an easier way to do this you could skip these steps if you want, there are a lot of different shortcuts and 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 um, easy ways to get around things in in um, recipes. It's very straight or in sorry tidy models. It's very streamlined. But this is like the standard way of doing it. Um, there's another package. It's called Parsnip, um, and it's for fitting models. Um, so, the cool thing about Parsnip, going back to what I was saying about syntax being heter heterogeneous heterogeneous um parsnip attempts to take all of these different models from all these different packages and create um uh, this is like a big deal this is like uh the part where you could really like tell that it's it, it creates like a unified interface because you have all these different uh models and then you have all these different engines uh, but it creates a unified interface for all these different models and engines and um, it's really cool and it's easy it's very easy and that's what's important ultimately um, so you have a couple of examples here uh, this is again the example that they used that he used um, that that jared used in uh, the uh, odsc training um, 
here you can see he's using an engine called XG Boost, something else that I don't, I, I looked it up. It's about boosted trees. I don't know what a boosted tree is. He explained it to me, I don't remember, but um, it's very cool. And uh, he gave a bunch of different examples how you can do, you could run a linear regression through all of these different engines. Um, and uh, it's, you know, they're, they're all different applications and different software, but it, it works. Um, so next you can fit your model. You can fit your model to training data, right? Now you're applying the mod, you're applying your model to your training data and um, you can either you can either extract the results and look at them um, like you see here you can convert the results to a tibble right and then ex use it on different program maybe you can plot it ggplot2 you can you can um, do a variety of different things with it um, and then here a workflow it allows you like the text says it allows you to bind pre-processing modeling steps together so you have um, you have like both the uh, the feature engineering and also the modeling in one object, and then you can interact with this workflow object. Like you can add and remove steps to it um, without having to like open everything back up again. Um, and this workflow function is actually you don't even need to prep and bake. You can just use workflow. You can just um, pipe your recipe into workflow. Um, or maybe the other way around, but regardless, you can you can do something, and then it takes care of prepping and baking for you. So you don't no longer have to calculate the statistics from the training data, and then and then apply it to your data set. Um, okay, so this is basically where my knowledge of this stuff ends. In fact, it actually ended like maybe ten minutes ago. But um, I'm still working through the book. It's a very long book, but it's very good. Uh, I recommend you guys take a look at it if you're interested. I'm creating like an R markdown. I'm creating like an R markdown um, document to sort of, because that's the way I learn the best is taking notes. Um, and then in a future, maybe in a future meeting or our SAS club or whatever, I can like go through these steps with the class. It's pretty long. I mean, it was an eight hour training session, but um, something that, the guy who led the trading session said is that it's the easiest machine learning workflow across any programming language that he knows of. And it seems pretty easy. I mean, it was very unintimidating. So anyway, that is my presentation on the one training that I went to that I then tried to learn more about um, during the conference from last week. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and let me know. Um, that's my presentation. Thank you.